When you're writing a piece of software, especially something that other people are going to use, arguably just as important as the code itself are the tests that come with it. I imagine most people watching this already know the importance of testing. If you don't, then I recommend going and watching a video or reading up about it because it really is important to know. I might actually make a video of my own, talk about it at some point. <laughs> In this video, we are going to be covering five easy tips to take your testing to the next level. And the best thing about them is that a lot of these are really, really easy to do. So once you know them, there's no reason not to use them. Of course, if you find this video helpful at any point, then consider leaving a like to let me know and maybe subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. But with all out of the way, let's take our testing to the next level. So to actually show all this off, I've just got this file here with some classes. We have a fruit class, an exception class, and then a box class. The idea of the program is that you can add and remove fruit to and from the box and you'll get an error if the box is full. It tracks the capacity and the volume and all this, that and the other. If you want to take a close look at the code, it will be in the description. I'm not going to look at it too hard because I want to get into my first trick. So the first two tricks revolve around writing better tests using parameterization and then the final three tests uh, go over different ways that you can run your tests and, and make the test a bit better that way. So we're going to go into test fruit and you'll see there's nothing particularly special in here. There's an X fail in here because I felt like it. Uh, but the rest of it is just, you know, testing init uh, the initialization and strings and whatever. But the first trick that I want to talk to you about is parameterization. And this actually comes pre-built with PyTest. And to do that, I'm going to copy paste this over here. And it's an adaptation of the, the init uh, test up here. So we're using pytest.mart.parameterize. And then we're setting the, uh, the parameters that we want to iterate over. So in this case, it's name and volume. And a name and volume will be passed into the test itself. And then we have a list of all the different combinations. So we have apple. And the, the volume of the, of the fruits are in cubic centimeters as I could work out on Google. So on apples, it was 107, bananas 156.1, oranges 217.8. If I go back over here, you see it's just name and volume. They get passed in here. And then this will actually run three tests. So you define one test function, but because we have three sets of parameters, it will actually run the test three times. And if I run this with PyTest, I test fruit with dash V, You'll actually be able to see this if I actually save the file. So that's what it is before. I meant to do that. And this is what it is after. So you can see this test fruit in it with params. And you see this apple 187, banana 156, orange 217 as three separate tests. And these are the three different sets of parameters that we specified. And this allows you to create multiple tests using the same base code. So you don't have to rewrite tests over and over again using the same thing. You could just pass a different series of parameters and test all sorts of different use cases. So you might want to test edge cases using this. You might want to test invalid cases using this potentially. However you want to use it, you can do it without rewriting tests. The second trick is doing a similar but not completely identical thing using something called hypothesis. So you do actually need to install this. We could do pip install, uh, I know not actually PyTest, it is its own library. Hypothesis like that. And we are using version 6.108.2. And if I just copy paste this in again, like that, and I need to go up to the top and do from hypothesis import given and from hypothesis dot strategies import floats and text. And you come down here and look at the code and we can see that we have this code here. It's pretty much exactly the same as before. It's just a separate test to show it off. But we have this at given decorator and this is what decorates the test using the, hypothe the hypothesis, there we go, strategies. So we can send it given text and floats, which will be passed into name and volume respectively. And then it creates a test strategy. Now it doesn't parameterize in the same way. It doesn't uh, run, well, it runs different tests, but it runs them internally. So it doesn't run test after test after test. It just does a series of asserts within the decorator code. But this will generate text and floats respectively and potentially flag up any issues that you haven't thought of. Like in this case, whoops, uh, it should, there we go, flag up an error 
saying that we haven't accounted for not a number. Uh, so we've got nans here. It's a nan equals nan. It doesn't work because we haven't accounted for it. And now we know that and we can account for it. If we don't want to deal with that, so if we want to say, all right, we don't we don't ever want to deal with nan, we can do that with false. And you could do the same with infinity as well. And it will now pass because there's nothing else wrong with the code. To be honest, hypothesis could be in a video on its own. And I might make a more extensive video on a hypothesis uh, in the future. But I just wanted to give a brief overview of what it was and how it worked and how it can allow you to find edge cases in your code that you may not have thought of before. So the third trick is using coverage to see where you've missed tests or where you need to add extra tests. So we're now in this test box file. As you can see, there is actually quite a few tests in here, fixtures and everything. I've gone, I've gone all out for you. So if we then install uh, pytest-cov, you see I've actually already got it installed. We're using version 1.4. Five, I think. I'm not sure if that's. And I'm using version five by the looks of things. There you go. And if we were to run pytest uh, double dash cov, we'll see that we get a report at the end with the coverage. So we have our coverage of box.py, but we also have coverage of our test files, which you don't actually want because this is going to positively skew our coverage to be higher than it actually is. So our coverage, we only have the one module, so this uh, will be our total coverage. It's actually 86%, but because we are taking the coverage of the tests, which are always going to run, we end up with 96%. And what this coverage does is it basically just looks at lines of code that have and haven't been run, and it can actually detect that these 36 lines have been run. We've actually missed five lines of code. If you wanted to fix this problem with the tests being included in the test coverage, then we could do, uh, we could actually specify a source using equals, or we can just do a space and the module or the package that you want to test. So we're going to do box. You now see that it only takes the box as coverage and we get an 86% total coverage. If we wanted to find out what we've missed, then we can uh, use a different cov report and we can set this to term missing, which is the one that I typically like to do you can actually see what lines of code we're actually missing out. So if we go back to box.py, if we go to line 45, you'll see that we're not testing this line of code. So we've forgotten, or in my case, intentionally, uh, to test our remove fruit function. And then similarly, we've forgotten to, to, to test the, uh, the sub operator as well. So now we have that information, we can go and write tests for those things. And what I like to do with this is I like to test a successful flow of everything and then look at the coverage, see what lines are missing and then just pick off each individual branch one by one. It's really useful for just making sure that you've, you've caught everything. The fourth trick I want to show you is reducing intertest dependencies. Now we don't actually have any intertest dependencies in the test suite I've got at the moment, uh, but thankfully we don't actually need it to really uh, test what we're doing. So what these are, are tests that are dependent on one another. So when one test runs to so say, if a uh, test box string only passed if text box if test box in it had already run. It's not particularly ideal at all if this test changes or it gets removed for whatever reason and this test is gonna break and, and suddenly we've got other problems. We want a configuration where each test is completely independent from another. So each test you can run singularly on its own and it will work fine. And when you're writing tests in a serial way, it's always going to run the test in the same order. And it, it can be easy to accidentally introduce into test dependencies. One tool you can use to negate that is pytest randomly. And this, all you need to do is install it. You don't actually need to change anything you're doing. And now if you run pytest, We'll see, we get a bit of a output here. So we see using randomly seed uh, 2377, this that, and the other. And this is important. I'll come back to why this is important in a bit. Uh, but you'll see that each time I run it, uh, the actual files are being run in a different order. And you'll notice if you look at test fruit, you'll see that the X fail is appearing in a different spot every time. 
apart from the three times where it was second <laughs> uh, three times in a row, but we don't need to talk about that. And that's because randomly is using a seed to run the tests at random. So first it runs the files randomly. It runs, uh, once it selects a file, it runs all the tests in that file before moving on to another file, but it runs all the tests within the file in a random order. And this means that if there are any inter-test dependencies or any other flaws in your you know, tests that might cause them to fail if they weren't run serially, this would be able to pick them up. If you did want something a bit more deterministic, maybe you wanted to run with a specific seed uh, a particular time, you could copy and paste this and then PyTest uh, run it like that. And you can see we're running the same seed every time. If you wanted specifically to run the last seed, you can just do randomly seed equals last and it will run the, the last run seed. And then you can fix up whatever was going wrong with that particular seed. Finally, the fifth trick in this video is using xdist to run tests in parallel. Now I will say this comes with a bit of an asterisk. This is only worth doing if you have like thousands upon thousands of tests. We have 21, so this is gonna massively slow it down. But if you have a huge, if you have a series of workers running tests in parallel, uh, and it's you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tests, maybe tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. If you run them with 10 workers, in theory, they're going to run about 10 times faster and your test suite is going to be massively sped up. So we can do pip install pytest xdist, like so. And then we can simply just run pytest-n and we're going to do auto. And what auto does is it will automatically use as many cores as your computer has. My computer has 10, so it will use 10 cores, 10 workers. And you can see that the test actually completed very, very quickly. Did it complete faster? 1.18 seconds versus... Or 0.25, okay, maybe not. It looks as though this line came up a lot quicker. Uh, but, yeah, of course the worker instantiation is going to have an effect as well. If you want to set them to 4, you could do that and then you suddenly just have four workers. The overhead is less. The total amount of time might be a little bit longer uh, though. So it's about finding a good balance. It's worth keeping in mind that you can use this in conjunction with uh, PyTest randomly. If you don't have it installed though, the test will be distributed randomly between the workers anyway. So if you have any inter-test dependencies that are unresolved, uh, PyTest xdist will actually pick them up as well probably. In terms of actually being able to specify which CPU a test runs on, so maybe you would want uh, all the uh, all the tests in test box to run on one CPU, and then all the tests in test errors to run on another, and all the all the ones in test three to run on another. That is quite awkward to put together at the moment. It involves putting all the tests in groups. And I'll probably link something in the description uh, about that because that's a, a, a little bit more complicated and it involves you having to mark every single test because if you don't mark a test in the group, it's just going to get thrown out randomly. That is something you can do if you really wanted to. I guess the idea of, of xdist is that you wouldn't need to or you wouldn't necessarily want to and that you would just distribute them all uh, randomly and not have any inter-test dependencies there. Yeah, if you are in need of speeding hundreds of thousands of tests up, the next disk might be the perfect thing for you. Let me know in the comments which of these tricks was your favourite, and let me know if you have any other tricks as well. There are plenty of other things that I didn't talk about in this video, so make sure to put them in the comments below so other people can find out about those as well. If you're interested in getting better at quality assurance and want more videos about how all these things work, then good news, because I have a series dedicated all this stuff called Perfect Python that will be linked in the end cards and I'll see you next time for whatever we do next.